Hello and welcome to the course. I'm your host today, Lee, and I'm speaking with Assistant Professor Chiwei Chang from the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. Professor Chang is an observational cosmologist and a survey scientist. She uses large optical survey data to study the evolution of the recent universe through a technique called weak gravitational lensing. Professor Chang is here to talk to us about her career path and how she became a universal University of Chicago professor. Shiwei, let's start off. Can you just give me an overview of your career? We can start in your undergrad years and then take me all the way up to your current role at the University of Chicago. I grew up in Taiwan. I mostly grew up in Taiwan. I was born in the States, but I went back when I was three. So I finished my undergrad in in Taiwan, National Taiwan University, in the physics department. Then I went off to Stanford to do my PhD, again, in the physics department, where I started, uh, basically started doing something that's closer to astronomy and astrophysics and kind of detached from, from my original physics background. Then I went off to Zurich, ETH Zurich, to do my first postdoc. After that, I came to Chicago as a KICP fellow. So this is the Kavli Institute of Cosmological Physics. Um, I did two years of that here and then became assistant professor 2018 after that. So yeah, and I am, however, five years into this. So Chiwei, you grew up in Taiwan. Tell me about what you thought you were going to be when you grew up, when you were a kid. I would say I never really had like a particular thing I wanted to be. I knew I wanted certain elements uh, in my life that I enjoyed being creative, being really asking interesting questions and solving interesting questions and somewhat close to nature. Those are sort of the, the small elements I wanted in my life. There are various things I probably said I wanted to be when I was young. <laughs> ranging from like a teacher, an artist, architect, scientist kind of not really came up. It was just sort of in the back of the mind. That's something I enjoyed and I'm somewhat good at. But being a scientist as a role, as a job itself, wasn't something I sort of like decided to do when I was like three or five. So yeah, it's interesting how life leads you to certain things. Yeah. And Do you feel like there's anything about, you know, the type of student you were, person you were as a child, where now you look back and you're like, oh, it makes sense that I'm an astrophysicist. (laughs) So this type of student was always reasonably good at math and physics, basically logical things, solving problems and thinking about things logically. That always has been somewhat of a strength. I did really like creative things. And I think I already mentioned that. I loved art class. I loved to doodle, paint, do any sorts of crafty things. I would I would argue that is still an important element in my job today, maybe in a different form. But I can see how that kid has evolved into this adult. And certain things do map, although not in like the most direct and straightforward way. What kind of student were you like when you were in middle and high school? Middle and high school. Okay. So I was very much an introvert. I was very quiet, like the the straight A students you kind of imagine. So I, I definitely was very hardworking. I was trying to get good grades and all this stuff. I, yeah, I think the kind of artistic Part of me is my was my way out and being like not as rule following as I am in other aspects. I will say that the education system in, in Taiwan is quite different from here in that it is very academic, meaning the whole goal of middle school is to get into a good high school. The whole goal of a high school is to get in a good university. And there's uh, very long hours of classes and very a lot of exams and a lot of tests. So it's not exactly the same as high school here. There's not that much flexibility in what you choose to do and not do. The thing maybe if I look back and and say that in our family, that was slightly different from other typical Taiwanese families is uh, our parents didn't make us go to all these cram schools. So although it's important to get into good high school and good college, 
they never thought that was necessary. They thought basically you go to school, you do your homework, that's enough. I really admire that philosophy. And I, I think that that did actually make the kids in our family kind of more independent and more have free time to do some of the other things that maybe other kids didn't have time to do. So yeah, so I credit my parents uh, hugely for where I am today. So how did you realize that you wanted to be an astrophysicist? Like what happened to lead you on this path? Let's see, where was that? In middle school, high school, I think I had like my first semi-encounter to things that are related to astrophysics or more real like earth science type of things. So there is there's this class and there was like a, a competition that I entered that exposed me to some of the you know, knowledge and some of the background and some of the like intriguing things that I found that kind of the universe can be explained and the things we see in, in our day-to-day lives, stars, galaxies, the planet, whatever, are really just part of this bigger explainable thing. Then I went into just like hardcore normal physics in undergrad. I did several research projects, but none of them are really astro particular. They were more condensed matter or more applied physics. And there was, yeah, I was in a lab so making circuit boards or adjusting lasers to shoot into crystals. Uh, so, so all like very different from astronomy. And that was sort of what I thought was what I would do when I applied for grad school. So when I applied for grad school, astronomy or cosmology wasn't really on my like top choices. And I went to Stanford. The first thing I thought I would want to do is like, I want to build something. Like I, I did lab the entire undergrad and I really enjoyed building things and then using my, so I was looking around for a project and an advisor. And that was when this like really big telescope project was starting. This is at that time called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, LSST. Now they changed their name. It's called the Rubin Observatory after this wonderful female astrophysicist, Vera Rubin. And there's another acronym associated, but not important. That was when I started my PhD and that project was starting. And there was, there was some like lab component to it, to build a chamber, to test for outgas in the cryostat, whatnot. So I, I started there. So I, I, I went in, I started doing like lab work about maybe one and a half year into my PhD. My advisor basically took me to a different professor and then said she needs to do some science. My second advisor started me on this more kind of simulation based and more kind of sciencey track. And before you know it, by the end of my PhD, I was doing studies of systematic effects related to uh, weak gravitational lensing. These are all acronyms I can explain later. And then really it was my postdoc years that I, I, uh, I became more embedded into this general cosmology theme that I'm now doing today and, and really enjoy. Again, like one thing I really, really attracted me throughout and, and kind of led me into this cosmology theme is of the beauty and the, yeah, the beauty of the theory, as well as just the general, more superficial aspect of images and, and like pretty things. Well, Chiwei, can you explain your interests to me? Like explain your research interests, I should say. Yeah. And can you explain it to me? Like, you know, I'm a sophomore in high school and I don't really know what <laughs> astrophysics is. Okay. So, so I call myself a observational cosmologist. Observational just means I'm, I'm not like super theoretical. I dabble in some aspects of theory, but I'm not the, the kind of uh, hardcore theorist. Cosmology, on the other hand, is this branch of astrophysics where the thing you're really interested in is the kind of the global evolution and content of the entire universe instead of how one galaxy actually formed, how the supernova went off, or how the star is showing this particular spectrum. We're really talking about a statistical, very global picture of the universe. So, so that's cosmology. The particular area that I work on is using these 
large galaxy surveys to answer questions in cosmology. So let me, let me unpack that. So galaxy surveys, so we know what galaxies are, right? Surveys really just means that we are mapping the sky. We're not focusing on one particularly interesting system. We're just continually taking pictures of the sky and mapping it to create a map of the universe. I am currently in like two big projects of this nature. One is the Dark Energy Survey, which is really big in Chicago, I think, I think you guys interviewed Josh Freeman, who is like one of the founders of Dark Energy Survey. So that's one that's basically finished. We're currently finishing the final analysis and should be out in a few years. The up and coming one is this thing I talked about that I started in my PhD, the Rubin Observatory. That thing is going to start taking data in a few years and will be a game changer in terms of how much of a sky can cover and how many galaxies it can collect. Just to get people maybe a, a, a skill of what we're talking about, the galaxies that we're using in Dark Energy Survey now to study cosmology using this technique called weak gravitational lensing is of the order of several hundred million galaxies. So these are like large numbers and we're really talking about like a lot of statistics and fishing out a signal out of a giant number of galaxies. And then LSST or the Rubin Observatory will be even larger. I can talk a little bit of weak lens about weak lensing if you think it's important to understand what I do. Yeah, if you, something you're interested in, yeah, go ahead. So weak lensing is one of the running themes through all, all the things I've been doing. The idea is that when you have light coming from a distant object, as the photons start moving towards you, as the light comes towards you, it gets slightly kind of perturbed. The trajectory gets slightly perturbed because of mass distribution between the object emitting the light and us, the observer. And the slight perturbation or the slight distortion of the light path is a prediction of general relativity. And basically it's just the light is following a particular shortest path in this unsmooth kind of gravitational potential from the object to us. Okay, so that is the kind of the basic of gravitational what lensing. So what does that mean? That means that when you have an object that is far away, by the time a light reaches you, you like your eyes would actually think it's somewhere else and not the original location that the object was at because of this light path is distorted and because your eyes think that light travels in a straight line. So for a single object, for a point object like a star, the effect is that what you see is not where it is at. So it's a displacement of the object. For a, a bigger object, such as a galaxy, the effect is that in addition to this displacement, the shape of the galaxy gets distorted. So a, a originally circular looking galaxy will appear elliptical and, and so on. Okay, so what? why is this even useful? When you have a gazillion galaxies in the sky, you can actually use the signal to extract the information about the stuff that's distributed in front of it. Because this distortion is coming from the mass distribution between the galaxy and us. So yeah, so that's the fundamental principle. You use statistical techniques to analyze millions of galaxies and extract this distortion signal that is an imprint of the mass distribution between the galaxies and us. And the reason why this is interesting is the way matter is distributed in the universe is governed by this fundamental model of the universe or theory of the universe. If you give me a different model, the matter will be distributed differently. And that would cause the galaxies to be distorted differently from this weak lensing effect. So yeah, so they're all connected and uh, measurable. That's fascinating. So I know that, you know, pursuing this type of career isn't necessarily easy. I'm wondering if you encountered any challenges along the way that you had to overcome. So I would say that one of the biggest things that I had to overcome was probably the, the culture aspect between me growing up in Taiwan and then going to California for my PhD. And I think it, it, is, it is an interesting thing because I don't think I realized 
it was that that much of an obstacle at that point. I just felt like frustrated and like things were not going anywhere, but I didn't realize that a big part of it was culture. So yeah, so so this ties back to uh, what I was saying earlier. I was born in the States. So to some extent, I thought I would sit back in even after like so many years growing up in Taiwan and getting like used to the culture. I thought coming to the States, it wouldn't be that difficult for me. But I think in the end, like my formative years were still spent in a different culture. And coming here, there was still a lot that I needed to learn from just kind of calibrating people around me, how they're, how they express things and how I should be expressing things, how I interact with people, um, and making friends, that sort of thing. So, so I think my PhD years, although I didn't realize it at that point, it really was quite hard for me. And coming out of the PhD, I feel like at that point I was somewhat calibrated, but it did took that long for me to get used to uh, how things work uh, here in the U.S. So that said, you know, who supported you? Where did you find support to, you know, overcome some of these cultural barriers and just, you know, find a way to move forward? Yeah. So my biggest supporter, uh, obviously, is my, uh, are my parents. They were always, yeah, they always kind of helped me ground myself and kind of helped me remember where I came from and how how it's already pretty impressive that I got where I got to. So a lot of things I worry about, maybe it's just overthinking things and I should just kind of get past it and move on. So they're obviously the like the most supportive people in my life. Um, there were several important kind of figures through my PhD years, including, of course, my PhD advisor. He always like was really willing to spend time with me talking about career stuff and Although she was not like a, at the time when we started, he wasn't like that much of an expert in the field I really was trying to pursue, but we worked things together and he was always very patient in seeing me uh, slowly getting my PhD. It was also this very important postdoc in our group that, yeah, basically I would say is, is one of the most important reasons I'm still here today. Like he really took care of me and, and walk me through how I should, how I should do research as well as how I should like be a nice person <laughs> in this academia, academia kind of environment and really hold my, held my hand through finishing my PhD thesis. So, yeah. So I think uh, aside from that, there is obviously all the, all the mentors and, and like more senior figures you, you encounter in the collaboration uh, working together, which I think added together is like, really important for uh, my career. So Chi Wei, why become a professor? Why not do something else with this skill set and this knowledge that you have? Well, okay. So uh, people will laugh at this, but my dad is a professor. He is a chemical engineer professor back in Taiwan. And when I was young, I sort of being a, trying to be a rebellion, I sort of always said, like, I will never be a professor. I don't want to take my dad's job. It looks like not that interesting. <laughs> don't tell him. So so it, it's funny, again, like you say that, but at the same time, I do think my dad's influence on my career is, is huge. Like just the kind of knowing that this is a path, I feel extremely privileged that, that happened to me, right? Because most people would not even see that as a normal, like a path a normal person can take. Whereas for me, it's it was very kind of obvious and down to earth because it's just my dad. So yeah, so I would say what led to where I am now is not like one incident, but it's just uh, kind of this, this long process of me knowing this is a job and then me knowing the good things about it just because I... I like I grew up with it. I know how flexible my dad's schedule is, although it's a lot of work. It is also rewarding. So kind of going going up the, the career path, it just sort of was a default. And I liked what I was doing. So why change kind of? 
uh, situation. So it was not like a like a groundbreaking realization of I have to be this, rather of like, I like my job, let's just continue doing it. And, and here I am. And what advice would you have for people considering entering this field? I'm thinking specifically of people who may be coming from abroad to pursue a PhD or pursue a career in academia in the U.S.? I mean, I guess just to just to know that it is normal, that it could be hard in the beginning. It is normal that you feel like you're not able to communicate pe- with people, especially if you're more of an introvert. But if you just stick to it and if you like the job enough, it is it is possible. And and in the end, you'll, at least for me, like you will start to enjoy some of it. So, so I guess what I'm trying to say is like, it does take time. I, I do like distinctly remember attending my first academic conference and feeling extremely lonely and not being able to talk to anyone. And I like didn't have any friends. That really just goes with time because you accumulate more friends as you grow older. So uh, once you get past the kind of the first painful <laughs> few conferences or like few years, it does turn around. And I would say it, it is worth it. And you grow so much by going through that process. What is the most gratifying or fulfilling or fulfilling part of the work that you do? Yeah. Okay. So I would say there, there are two things and they're somewhat related. So I, I, I said earlier that I, I work in this field where it's big collaborations, putting together a, a giant data set and inferring kind of the story of our universe. I think it's super gratifying when we uh, kind of start to pull together the different parts of the experiment and like a picture emerges, if that makes any sense. I think that process, of course, it doesn't happen every day, right? This is like a multi-year process. But by the time kind of you finish the analysis and and everything starts to either make sense or not make sense, that for me is, is one of the one of the most kind of fulfilling moments and kind of things we work towards. And along that is seeing basically the students or the postdocs you mentor kind of through this process, growing into their own human being and their own kind of independent researcher. I think that's, that's super cool. And uh, in our collaboration, I started as a grad student and now I'm a professor, and now I'm seeing people coming up and going through this process. I think that is another thing that I I really enjoy. Thank you, Professor Chi Wei Chang, for your time today. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow, and share this episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Stay tuned for more and thanks for listening.